This is the case of Muva, real name Stephen Aguera. On the 2nd of July in 2014, Muva, who I will refer to as Aguera, as well as Stephen Lansana and at least two others attempted a burglary on the top floor flat at 5A Glebe Crescent in Hendon. It was believed there was between £20,000 and £30,000 cash at the address. This took place shortly after 11pm while the owner was away. With the assistance of a locksmith, they would gain access to the premises. Although no cash was found, a number of items were taken including a television. In the early afternoon of the next day, on the 3rd of July, Ture Yusebi would be driving a VW Passat with Stephen Aguera and Stephen Lansana, as well as two other occupants including Bruno Guimares. At some point, they decided to return to the address at Glebe Crescent to take care of unfinished business, wanting to get access to the flat and then to the money. They were unsuccessful in their attempts. At around 4.30pm, they decided to abandon the burglary attempt and drove off into Downage. What happened afterwards was substantially evidenced by CCTV. Shortly before 4.45pm, the Passat carrying the men was on Parson Street in Hendon, where it passed a Lithuanian national named Zydrunas Lorena Vicious. He and his father, Pranas, were on their way home from work, walking towards a bus stop. Yusube, who was driving, brought the vehicle to a stop. Aguera, Lansara and Grumares would exit from the car with the intention of allegedly robbing the two men. Lansana had a bag and prior to leaving the vehicle there was some activity at the boot. So the three of them then ran in the direction of Zydrunas and his father. The court was told that they approached the two Lithuanians from behind. During the attack Zydrunas received two serious knife wounds, one to the back of his right forearm and the second and fatal one to the left side of his body which penetrated to a depth of 16 centimeters. The knife would break a rib in two, damaging the main artery of the body before entering the right lung. The attackers made off with Zydrunas' watch and bag. The knife used in the attack was a large hunting Rambo knife with a black edged blade and a serrated upper edge, which later on the court argued had been brought to the scene by Lansana in his bag, although it was agreed that the positioning of the CCTV could not identify where the knife came from. It was recovered from the roadside in Rowley Lane, Hendon. The knife, which had a blade of 23.5 cm in length and a maximum width of 4 cm, was then examined by a forensic scientist with the expertise in bloodstains and the interpretation of DNA profiling evidence. Part of his work was to recover non-blood cellular material to determine who might have touched or handled it. One area of blood staining was swabbed and sent off for DNA analysis. This gave the police a complete DNA profile and that would match the profile of Zydrunas with a match probability of one in one billion. The whole of the handle of the knife was swabbed to recover any cellular DNA that might be present. DNA analysis of the swab produced a low level mixed profile indicating at least four contributors with a major DNA profile at most of the areas tested. Zydrunas' DNA was mixed in with four others on the handle. This would give the defendants the chance to argue that he may have produced the knife. The defendants, Aguera and Lansana, were arrested in 2014. Aguera would answer no comment in his first interview, but when later questioned, he served a prepared statement denying involvement in the incident and putting forward an alibi defence, saying that he was with a friend called Paul Makoko. Lansana answered no comment to all questions except to provide his name and address. At the top of the prosecution case, Aguera changed his defence and plea in relation to the conspiracy to commit burglary, which he then admitted. He then also admitted presence at the scene, saying that he left the Passat in order to return to the address they intended to burgle. He did not say anything about the intention to rob Zydrunas. An application was made by counsel on Aguera's behalf to discharge the jury on the grounds of prejudice after his change of account. This was rejected. The evidence that Aguera gave was that as he, together with Lansana and Guimaraes, caught up with Zydrunas and his father, Zydrunas began to behave in an aggressive and racist manner towards Gumares. Aguera mentioned that the two had had previous issues with each other, and he called Gumares an N-word. Zydrunas then produced a knife, and in the tussle, the knife went to the ground. Aguera said that he picked it up, and acting in defence of himself and Lansana, would stab Zydrunas. Aguera accepted that he had subsequently wiped the knife down and then disposed of it in Rowley Lane. Lansana also gave evidence. He too would deny that there was any question of robbing the Lithuanian men and asserted that he saw Zydrunas take a knife from his father's bag shortly before he directed the comment fucking nigger towards Grimares. He said himself nor Lansana had any physical contact with the deceased and did not steal a watch or bag. Both Lansana and Aguera placed reliance on the fact that the deceased had convictions for violence in Lithuania including for robbery. He had also been cautioned in the UK for possessing a knife and had a history of calling black people niggers. 
The evidence of Guimaraes was very different to that of his co-accused, however. He said that as he got out of the Passat and followed the other two, Aguera and Lansana went to the back of the car. He heard them rustling and Aguera say, let's get it, which the court would contend was reference to the knife. The two men then caught up with the Lithuanians and attacked them. He said that one of the other two had a knife and he denied that the deceased had racially abused him and said that the Lithuanian men had done nothing to encourage any aggression. It was put to cross-examination that he was trying to distance himself from his co-accused. At this point, the case would take a strange turn. The jury had seen a video which is played to all jurors who intend to do service at the Central Criminal Court. This video included information that if the jurors were to attend court, they should only discuss the evidence in the case where all 12 members of the jury were gathered together along with other warnings about research and about not discussing the case with family or friends. Such a warning sometimes is abbreviated and is usually repeated at different stages of the trial. Unfortunately, in this case, the judge did not instruct the jury only to discuss the evidence when all members were together, and neither prosecution nor the defence counsel actually noticed this. On Friday the 1st of May, towards the end of the trial, five of the jurors, including a white juror, who I will refer to as PB, went for a drink at the Corny and Barrow wine bar. At about 10.30 p.m., PB and a couple of other male jurors were still at the Corny and Barrow. PB then became involved in a confrontation with a black man who was a part of another group. PB was said to have had an alcohol problem. He had drunk a number of pints and he was definitely worse for wear. CCTV footage captured him acting aggressively towards the black man and there was evidence that he referred to him as a black cunt. He was arrested for racially aggravated public disorder offence and subsequently received a police caution, although the officer responsible for that investigation reported that the incident was no longer construed as racist based on the language used being taken out of context. When these facts were revealed on the following Monday council on behalf of the applicants, it was argued that because of the racial element in the trial, the entire jury should be discharged. It was not sufficient merely to discharge PB. As a result, the judge would have to examine the jury. The judge watched the relevant CCTV and then read the police report of the incident and heard the evidence from the five jurors to establish what had happened. There was no evidence that any of the jurors except PB had been involved in any aggressive, racist or inappropriate behaviour while at the Corny and Barrow or any other time. It did emerge, however, that the five jurors had spoken briefly about the case while at the wine bar. The judge discharged PB but went on to address the other four jurors. He went on to highlight that they were impressed by the openness and honesty of the four jurors who were with PB. These jurors willingly shared details about what they had drank, the events that occurred and the conversations that took place. Importantly, none of them reported hearing any racist language from PB on that particular night or before. The judge fully trusts their honesty. In the judge's opinion, there is no reason to believe that any of these remaining jurors shared similar views or attitudes with PB. It was submitted by the defence that PB might have influenced the jury more subtly on the basis that the other members of the jury seemed to like him. That potential influence was particularly significant in a case where racist attitudes were at its heart. Criticism was also levelled at the failure to comply with the requirement that the jury should not speak out about the case when not altogether, but the judge did not consider this last point to be fatal. The judge would say this, I have determined that this trial can continue fairly with this jury and I do not consider that an informed outsider would take the view that there is either evidence of bias amongst the 11 nor that there is an appearance of bias based on everything that has occurred. The judge then went on to explain that she would tell the jury only to talk about the case when they're all together and not overheard. Also, she would tell them to keep an open mind until they had heard speeches in her directions for each one of them to inform her that if she was aware of any reason whatsoever, they could not fairly continue to try the case. Although the transcript of her remarks to the jury is not available, it's not suggested that the judge did not loyally follow the path that she described. In court, barristers for Aguera and for Lansana both repeated the argument before the judge, asking whether a fair-minded and informed observer who was aware of the relevant facts would conclude that there was a real possibility or real danger that the jury was biased. They further emphasised the underlying issue of racism raised by the case and the potential insidious influence of the 12th juror who was discharged following his comment. The fact that he was drunk at the time was irrelevant.
The fact that jurors had discussed the case outside of their fellow jury members was an additional factor to be brought into balance that some might have been affected by what PB said. The judge argued that in court, the relevant juror was discharged and remaining jury vowed that they did not hear anything from him that would be construed as racist. The judge would say, It is also said that the discharged juror was popular with the others and that his discharge may have led to resentment against the defence. This proposition carries no weight. It would tend to suggest to discharge one juror should lead to the discharge of an entire jury. How is a judge to determine whether a discharged juror is more or less popular? How is a judge to decide when the discharge of one juror will be laid at the door of the defendants as opposed to the prosecution or the judge? When this was looked at by the others, it was said by the CPS, in our judgment, the judge handled this difficult issue with skill and her ruling was entirely justified by her analysis of the evidence. It need only be added that this conclusion is further reinforced by the fact that the jury dealing with four black men convicted two and acquitted two others. Another appeal was put in on the grounds that the judge had improperly dealt with the DNA evidence on the murder weapon. This resulted in Aguera and Lansana's barristers arguing in court about whose weapon it was. The defence teams argued that the weapon was produced by Zajunas. However, the DNA evidence was said to be one in a billion chance that Zajunas had produced the weapon, and the judge noted that the evidence was looked over by the jury, and it was their job to agree on whether the defendants were guilty or not. It was common ground that the fatal injury had been inflicted by Aguera, the issues for the injury being in whose possession the knife originated and whether it was self-defence. In relation to the other defendants, including Lansana, the judge directed the jury in relation to the law of joint enterprise. In the case of Lansana, the jury had to be sure that A. Aguero was guilty of murder, that B. He was involved in a joint enterprise to rob Zajunas, that C. At the time of embarking at the robbery, he was either carrying a knife or was aware that one of his co-defendants was carrying a knife, D. That at the time of embarking on the robbery, he realised that there was a real risk that one of his co-defendants might use the knife to stab the intention of killing or causing really serious bodily harm. And finally, they would have to be sure that he went ahead and played a part in the robbery knowing all of the relevant facts previously stated. The defence of Lansana would say that a joint enterprise theory should be thrown out due to precedent set on a previous case which was unrelated to this. However, it would be stated that knowledge or ignorance that weapons, generally, or a particular weapon, is carried by Defendant 1, will be evidence going to what the intention of Defendant 2 was, and may be irresistible evidence that one way or another, but it is still evidence no more. The court would be told that the considerations for appealing convictions based on this change, both for in-time and out-of-time appeals. In deciding if the legal threshold is met for an appeal, the court will mainly consider how strong the argument is that the change in the law would have actually made a difference, that law being the joint enterprise law. The court would also look at other factors like whether the person appealing was involved in less serious criminal activities. In the end, the court would conclude that there's no substantial injustice in this case. As for the sentence appeal, both applicants sought permission to appeal their sentence under the Criminal Justice Act of 2003, but the judge would deny it. The judge in the appeal had concluded that the starting point for the term handed out was appropriate and justified based on the severity of the crime. Therefore, the court would refuse the applications for leave to appeal. So, Mover would lose his appeal along with the co-defendant. The original charges would stand and on 14th of May 2015, after a trial lasting five weeks, Stephen Aguera and Stephen Lansana were convicted at the Central Criminal Court in front of Judge Poulet and a jury. Their alleged crimes were robbery and murder. Both had previously pled guilty to conspiracy to commit burglary on the 8th of April 2015 during the trial. Two other defendants were acquitted of murder and robbery. On the 15th of May, the judge sentenced both to life imprisonment for murder with a minimum term of 30 years, taking away time spent on remand. Concurrent terms of 10 years imprisonment were imposed for robbery and four years imprisonment for conspiracy to commit burglary. In Aguera's case, a suspended sentence of 12 months imprisonment was activated concurrently. And that is the full case of Mover. Reading through all of this is quite tough as there's not any direct transcriptions of the initial murder trial, but there are some of the appeal, which is where I got most of this information from. I'm really quite surprised that this case had not got more attention previously due to the events transpiring with the jury and the racial undertones of the whole case. But I guess the fact remains that there was a person who was with the defendants who ultimately testified against them. He even went as far as to say that the man who was killed was not aggressive. This really puts into perspective that you have to be careful what kinds of situations that you go into and who you choose to spend time with. Not only are you risking your own life and potentially risking your friends' lives, 
but you may take somebody else's life. And even if you think somebody has your back and will follow street rules, in reality, most people will talk when they're faced with a life sentence and some for a lot less. But all in all, it's been a sad story for everyone involved and I urge anybody listening to this, if you are currently involved in street activity, please reconsider your future. This is literally the worst time in history to be a criminal. There's cameras everywhere, from the public pulling out phones, to CCTV, to ring doorbells, to dash cams, and even to bus camera footage, as well as informants and snakes. People who want to rob and kill you, or people who just want to see you locked up. Trust me, there are ways out. Mover was somebody who actually had a route out, but for whatever reason, whether it was the wrong place, wrong time, or however the events transpired, he would not get to see his full potential. A little bit of backstory information about Mover. He's credited by many as being one of, if not the best rapper from the UK. Being able to turn pain and reality into music that resonates with people on levels that not many can reach, while also having the diversity to create party anthems and also being one of the elite lyricists in UK rap. The saddest thing in life is wasted talent. That's an excerpt taken straight out of a Bronx tale. Not only would the world never know what Zajunas would have done in life, we have also lost out on a brilliant musician who could have been inches away from success at this time. We have seen how his friend Potter Paper has come out of prison and been incredibly successful, and the two have similar styles when rapping, but I would even go as far as to say that Mover has more versatility and is able to make club style songs. So seeing where Potter is now, everyone including Mover must be wondering where would he have been if these events did not take place. But sadly, we will never know. Comment any thoughts and suggestions for future videos. Subscribe for more content like this. Rest in peace to Zajunas. And also, I just want to quickly say to people, I'm going to be setting up an Instagram account soon and a Twitter account. So if you are stuck in the street life and you need help with trying to get a job, trying to write your CV, trying to get out of the situation you're in, please get at me and let me know what, set up an Instagram that no one knows about, set up a Twitter that nobody knows about, and please let me know what your handle is on there and I will help, I'll personally help anybody that messages me or leaves a comment. So anyway, guys, next time I'm out.